Show. Well, it's a pleasure for me to be on your show. You started your journey as a young boy uh, translating Bible from uh, Greek to Latin to German. Were you aware at the time that uh, words like angels and uh, heaven need to be replaced with extraterrestrials in space? Not at that time. When I was a boy, 16 year old, I had a wonderful concept and belief of God. Whatever God is, nobody knows, but in my opinion, God had to be omnipotent. I mean, God is out of time. God needs no uh, experiment and then he has to wait what the result is. He knows the result in advance. Or God would, would not need a vehicle in which to move around from point A to point B. So, when we made these translations as boys, I read in the Bible that there a God is described which uses a vehicle. Just read, for example, the prophet Ezekiel. He uses a vehicle to move around and God descends on the holy mount with smoke, fire, trembling, loud noise and so on. So I simply had doubts in my own education, in my own Catholic education and I wanted to find out if other communities in antiquity have similar stories. So that was the beginning of Chariots of the Gods. Do you think that ancient astronauts gave us the basic tools, the uh, scientific information and the intelligence to achieve who we are as species today? Uh, definitely. Without the visits from extraterrestrials, we would never be humans. We would still be some sort of ape. You see, I learned in my high school that it all started, life on our planet started some millions and millions of years in the so-called primordial soup. What's that name of the Primordial soup. Ah, okay. So the atoms came together and formed molecules and so on. In the meantime, modern science say no, this was wrong. This is not anymore true. The, the beginning of life has come from outside. So the DNA, so to say, came from outside. Then the rest is evolution for quite some millions and millions of years. And finally extraterrestrials showed up again and they changed some genetic information from our ape, our forefather, into the modern man as we are. So without them, we would not think we would still be apes. Do you think we are close to uh, traveling to other stars and interacting yeah. with our, our star people? Well, close, it's a question of time. So. Uh, Do you think technology is there uh, while it's being hidden from us? If the money would be there, if uh, the governments on this planet, especially in the United States, would give the money, we would, have, we would have landed on Mars 20 years ago. So the technology to go there is, is available. It's the money which does not exist for it. And for interstellar travel, that is another question, you know, interstellar means from star to star. Mm -hmm. That's maybe a question of the next 100 years yeah. until we reach that. But planetary, interplanetary travel in our solar system definitely is possible within the next 30 years, no problem. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, you were talking at your lecture about uh, panspermia. Can you talk a little bit yeah. about that? You see, in several of the old holy writings, including the Bible, by the way, by the way they uh, say 
that the sons of the gods, or in some translation, the fallen angels, had sex with humans. So you ask, how is this possible? I mean, extraterrestrials, they are obviously completely different to us. How could they have sex with humans? Uh, they must have a different sexual apparatus, etc. But there is a theory which is called panspermia. Panspermia comes from the Swedish Nobel Prize winner, Savante Arrhenius, 70 years ago. That's not a new theory. And panspermia explains the situation. Somewhere in our Milky Way, the first intelligent form of life started. This first intelligent form of life had an interest to spread out their own life in a section of their universe. Now they take simply billions of billions of DNA. Mm -hmm. They spend DNA in a section of the Milky Way. Of course they know in advance that most of this DNA will uh, land into a sun and will be burned because of the gravity of the sun or on other planets where there are no conditions of life. But the part of it will land on a similar planet than the one who started this game. And now life starts on this planet and evolution starts. And by the end of evolution, you have a similar product. There's no way out in evolution because evolution has so-called unchangeable forms. What this is is too complicated to explain now. I will explain it on the ship somewhere. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so now as soon as you accept the panspermia theory, it makes sense that the others had sex with us because we are the offsprings of them. The question why should extraterrestrials be similar to us is rubbish. They are not by coincidence similar to us. We are similar to them, which is not the same because we are the offspring. We are the result. And then sex functions, of course. You know, a lot of people talk, say God created everything, uh, but no one can really explain what God is. What do you think God is? No one knows what God is. We cannot explain God, but we know that God does exist because the universe exists and we exist and everything is here. So there must be a creation somehow. And in every respect with religion, we call it God. I'm, I'm a deep believer in God and I pray every evening. But I'm not anymore a believer uh, in my Christian education. This has changed. So. You were raised Catholic, right? I was raised as a Catholic, strict Catholic for six years in a, in a boarding school led by Jesuits. So that's why we were educated very strong. I heard that Jesuits uh, like 25% extraterrestrials. Do you know anything about that? Uh, no, I heard some rumors, but I don't believe yeah, it. Yeah, it would make sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> Are you optimistic for a future of human race? Definitely, yes. Of course, we will have problems, and uh, I really predict we will have sooner or later a, a religious war. Mm -hmm. Something will happen on this planet. Like it will something be, is coming up. Soon. Yeah, Do something is that? coming up to us. But after this, it's all over, and uh, mankind will survive, of course, and have a, a fantastic future. By the way, Golden Age. I am sure that the so-called gods, the extraterrestrials, return. And this very soon, within the next 20 years. You don't so, think they have been back already and visiting for many years? Uh, I think at the moment we are under observation and I can prove this. I will do it in my speeches. But uh, these so-called gods, soon, soon as they show up officially, soon as we know they are here and they are brothers and sisters, our wars on the planet will end. They okay. make no sense anymore. We, we understand that we are all united. One. We are one. It doesn't matter if we are black or white or, or, or red or what religion we have. We are the humans, the united humans. And we are against or uh, in a family against the others, the extraterrestrials. So not against in the sense of war, but we are one group and they are another group and so on. So the wars will end on the planet Earth anyhow. So you think this closure will happen? That will happen at some point. Uh, uh, very, very Everybody's soon. Everybody's waiting for that. Very soon. In antiquity, and I'm a specialist of antiquity, of all texts, so many texts predict that the so-called gods, the extraterrestrials, they promised to the humans thousands of years ago, we will return. And they will return, of course. Yes, yes. I mean, in all the ancient stories, uh, the message is always, we are here to help. Uh, do you think that that was always the message? In the, in the past, yes. In the past, the extraterrestrials, well, in the religious books, they are called the gods. In reality, the gods were extraterrestrials. The extraterrestrials were always helpful. They, they were teachers. They helped us in science, in, in, in engineering, in different belonging, in mathematics. You know, what we have, our calendar, for example, we know exactly that the Earth surrounds 
the sun in 365 day plus uh, uh, leak year, etc. But this knowledge in original, thousands of years ago, comes from the extraterrestrials. Mm -hmm. So we learned a lot of them. What is the most scientific uh, evidence uh, of extra extraterrestrials? Of high technology, well, <coughs> there is an omakunko, there is a, uh, something... Yeah, you see, we have some uh, constructions on the planet which we cannot understand. For example, in the highland of Bolivia, there's a place called Pumapunku. And Pumapunku shows gigantic blocks of granite, and I mean gigantic, absolutely, some of them are 80 tons. So, and they are polished, and you see the edges, and so on. And the official archaeology believes that this was made by the highland Indians, the so-called Aymara. But the Aymara people were Stone Age people. They had absolutely no possibility to do so. And their mythology says it was the gods who did it. The gods did it in one night. So I suggest the extraterrestrials constructed some sort of basic camp mm -hmm. where they want to, de to deposit their scientific instrument. That's only one case. Another case, is, which is optically very, very uh, fantastic, is the tombstone of Palenque. Palenque is in Mexico, Palenque is a Maya city. And in 1952, they found under the Temple of Inscription a tombstone. Not a small stone, big, 3.8 meters long, 2.2 meters large, and on the stone a fantastic chisel. You see the man bending forward like a, a motorcycling racist. Uh -huh. uh, he, he uses his hands to manipulate control. He's sitting on a chair. Uh, around him is something like a capsule. And at the end, you see a fire, a linking flame coming out. Now, the most modern interpretation, by my specialists, not by me, is in reality that it has to do with the cosmos, with the universe. It shows Pakal. Pakal was the second last ruler of the city of Palenque. But Pakal is running out, going out into the universe with the gods. So optically, that's fantastic. From the old literature, I know so much where our ancestors thousands of years ago, they clearly described the gods, the teachers. What is your plan for the future? Never ending story. Never ending. In the meantime, I passed my 80 years old, my body functions and my brain functions, and I'm happy to uh, worldwide to come out with the message, what I learned in my life. But I always make it clear what I do has nothing to do with the new religion. Mm -hmm. Forget it. I turn myself in my tomb. It's, if some idiots come and turn out, out my idea in some religious sect, that's not what I want. What I want is just take it into consideration. Look at all these mysteries of the past with my eyes and you come to a similar conclusion. What is your message for the future generation of ancient astronaut theories? It will grow and grow. It will become definitely a scientific branch of the universities. But, you know, archaeology, when archaeology started, it's more than 100 years ago, it was not science. Some rich man simply collected objects in, in, in Egypt and somewhere. And later, to make an ordering, they invented archaeology. Archaeology is now a very respected science. The same thing happened with anthropology. Before Charles Darwin, there was no anthropology. And then Darwin came up with his theory that we are the descendants of the apes and so on. So now we have anthropology, a scientific brand. So with the ancient astronauts, it's the same thing. It all starts with speculation. And then you come out into a thesis or a hypothesis, and slowly, slowly, you can uh, differentiate what conditions, indications are well, are good and what are bad. And now slowly it becomes a scientific branch. So the future of ancient astronauts, it will be teached on universities. The name of our program is Bridging Heaven and Earth. What does Bridging Heaven and Earth mean to you? I am always bridging between heaven and earth. I am a human grown up here on this planet with my body, but my brain is up there in the universe. This is Colombia. Colombia is a state in South America. And there, in the middle of the jungle, about 25 years ago, they discovered a city. You see it here. This city is called the Lost City. Finally, the first archaeologists come there, and they find out who were the owner of the city. By the way, if you look at it, it looks like a wedding cake. One terrace built next to the other. And this city, the lost city, it all together is bigger, bigger than Machu Picchu in Peru. Really? You know Machu Picchu? 
but this is not open for tourism because the people still live there, the descendants of the original tribe. The original tribe were the Dogu. I was at the Kogi. I was brought there by a helicopter, by an, by an army helicopter. Otherwise, if you have to find the city, you have to go by horse. It will take about five days to find the place. So, not open to tourism. This whole jungle is completely, completely built over with stones, millions and millions of stones, not large stones like megaliths, small stones. You see that stairway up there? I counted the step. It's 1,137. Incredible. <coughs> always one terrace to the next terrace. Wherever you look around, it's all built, it's all construction. The lost city, officially in archaeology, they call the city Buritaca dos Cientos. What does this mean? Buritaca is a small river which flows here through the, <coughs> the valleys. And that Buritaca river has about 200 side rivers, side rivers, creeks. That's why they call it Buritaca dos Cientos. Now, archaeology found out who were the constructors of that city. One terrace next to the other. You see it here? It was the Kogi or the Kagawa Indians. And when the Spanish came to, to South America about 450 years ago, they killed and destroyed everything. They also killed most of the Kogi Indians. Some of them, some of their leaders survived. And they still live <coughs> in that old city here. Now they have a very, very interesting mythology. This Kagawa Indian says that first, gods have descended from the sky. They have a complicated word for their gods. And then a great flood came. And the gods disappeared with some humans in a ship. And when the flood was over, the gods returned from heaven again. And they are absolutely persuaded that the gods will return again. By the way, in one of these next uh, uh, years, they are waiting for the return of the gods. And they have very, very interesting symbols. You see, this is one of the Kagaba yeah, huts, you see, houses now. The house is composited of nine different levels. And we, the earthlings, we are living on, on level number five at the moment. But beneath us are, are four other levels, levels and up of her are four more levels. Everything is constructed in astronomy. All true, it's seen from a technical point of view. It's primitive. It's not houses. It's just straw. You see, this here is the house of the female. This here is the house of the male. Now, these two buildings of constructions are put together. You see, there is a, a, a cross the stack across the branch, whatever. Now, in exactly March 21st, the sun rises up and the sun makes a shadow just between this long stick between this one. You see it here. That means it's springtime. Uh, fertilization. You see, you should put now the uh, seeds for in, in, into the earth. So it's all not coincidence. Also, they are technologically compared with us primitives. They are not primitives at all. And they are waiting for the return of the gods. Okay, this was okay. So that's the Kagawa. You are not able to go there, nobody can go there. The next mystery is somewhere in Africa. This is Dogon. Dogon territory. Dogon is a tribe in Central Africa. The main city of Dogons is called Timbuktu. I will later tell you a joke about the book. <laughs> First story. So. Now, the Dogon tribe are again seen from a technical point, only technical point. Compared to our technology, they are primitives. But in reality, they have a high society, a high knowledge in their brain about astronomy and incredible things. Still today, they have festivities. And every year, they make different masks. The masks of them are very, very complicated. And they make uh, special dances with their masks, and they dance 
around a circle and they say every fifth, by, by the way, when the first the ethnologists came there, they observed these masks and they observed the ritual festivities and they asked, what are you doing here? What's the meaning of all these complicated masks? So, and the Dogon high priest handsome, every 50 year, an uh, invisible star surrounds the big star up there and they pointed to our Sirius. So, every 50 year, an invisible star surrounds Sirius and that's the reason for their festivity. The bigger they have every year a small festivity and every 50 year a gigantic festivity. The reason because of invisible stars around Sirius. Now, ethnologists say, hey, come on. You adore an invisible star which surrounds Sirius every 50 year. But if the star is invisible, you, you cannot see it. How will you know that there is a star and surrounding every 50 year? The tribe man said, we know it because we were visited by gods and the gods name were Nomo and Nomo came from that star and Nomo told us that the, the bright shining Sirius which we see is surrounded by an invisible little star and this invisible star surrounds the bright shining Sirius every 50 years <coughs> that's why they make their big festivity every 50 years now if you look to Sirius Sirius is the, the, the biggest star in our uh, Milky Way, seen from, from us, and uh, normally fixed stars are fixed stars because they don't move. They are fixed in one point. Now, uh, an American astronomer, his name was Bessel in 1927, he uh, uh, remarked by his telescope that the big Sirius is moving always a little, up and down, which should not be. A star is fixed, it should not move a big star. So he suggested there must be something around Sirius which influences the movement of Sirius itself. And only much later, when the modern telescopes of 5 meter telescopes have been developed, they found out that Sirius is surrounded by an invisible star. In astronomy, the big Sirius is called Sirius A and the invisible star is called Sirius B. But this invisible star is a so-called white dwarf. White dwarfs are very, very strong in mass. They have a strong mass gravity, but you cannot see it. And this invisible Sirius B surrounds Sirius A every 50 years. But these people could not have known this. Again, from a technical point of view, they are primitives. They have no telescopes. They have no more modeling. And they know it and they make their dances since centuries. So it has been suggested maybe a missionary visited them. And the missionary knew something about astronomy. So he told the, 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 the Dogon, well, you, you adore Sirius, but there is a star going around them. No, it's not true. Because they have their knowledge since centuries. You see, their masks are so complicated that the mask had a date in it. Every 50 years, there are other masks. And every 50 years, there are other inscriptions or signs on this mask. Now when the festivity, the big festivity is over, they do not destroy their mask. They keep it in the main house. Now you simply have to count the masks. Every mask counts for 50 years. 50, 100, 150, 200, 150, etc. So you know they are doing this since eternity. So there is no missionary who could have influenced this. And we know about Sirius B, only since 1927. Uh, it's an absolute mystery. So they say the God who visited them, his name was Nomo. And Nomo promised them to return one day. Like the Kogi in South America, you know, with this city of Theras. They here in Africa have the same knowledge and the believing. All two these so-called primitive tribes are separated from civilization. They know of the return of the gods and they wait for the return of the gods. Down in South Africa is a state called Zimbabwe. And earlier it was uh, Rhodesia, now it's Zimbabwe. And Zimbabwe has an incredible ruin. Nobody understands the ruin of Zimbabwe because there is no <coughs> treasure, there is nothing to hide, there are no openings, there are no windows, you could not shoot down, you could do, do nothing on this gigantic wall. It always was the question, what is it? The locals <coughs> live here, they say, 
we don't know who made this world and what the purpose is. Now in the meantime, we find out that this world in Zimbabwe, by, by the way, it's a symbol of Zimbabwe, represents in reality the star of Sirius with the surrounding of the invisible A, Sirius A, Sirius A is visible, and the invisible Sirius B. They show exactly how Sirius B, this is Sirius, the big star, block, and this wall symbolizes Sirius B surrounding Sirius. You see it here. So, someone of the ancestors of the two days Dogo must have represented, must have made all this in stone for eternity. And now we found out, hey, that's the Sirius system. You know, Sirius, the bright shining Sirius is down here. And the invisible Sirius is surrounding in an eclipse like this. And the, the Dogon, they know that there are not only Sirius B, there are some planets surrounding them. That's why we see other things here. It's a model of Sirius in stone. And another mystery, the never ending story. Yesterday we were talking about the cargo cult. And you all remember what cargo cult is. Cargo cult is uh, technology which somebody does not understand. So, whenever two civilizations come together, the technologically primitive civilization sees some technology, doesn't know what it is, and copies it, not knowing what they're doing. What is this here? This comes from Egypt. Officially, they call it a jet pillar. What is a jet pillar? Jet pillars in Egypt, they exist in different sizes. Very small, very big, you find them all over. Always a jet pillar. <coughs> and what do archaeologists, Egyptologists say? What is a jet pillar? There are about 15 different meanings in literature. And no one knows what it is. Some say, it's a symbol of the god Ptah. Ptah was the god of science in ancient Egypt. Others say no, it's a symbol of fertility. I even read in one uh, textbook that it should be a penis. I don't want such a penis. <laughs> <laughs> Others say it's a, an ear of corn. Then it's a symbol of eternity. Always a jet pillar. No one knows what the jet pillar is. I say it's cargo cult. These ancient Egyptians saw some, some, something technology. They could not understand it, what it was. It belonged to the gods. It was important. So they copied it and made it. And I tried to prove this in the next minutes. So, you see, always. Jet pillar. This here is the temple of Abydos in Egypt. All Egyptian, most of the Egyptian temples are all uh, right and left of the Nile. This is Abydos. Abydos was constructed by the pharaoh Seti, uh, Setos in about 1300 BC. Now inside this, you still today have wonderful paintings in color. And there you see the jet pillar. In that case, the jet pillar is so big that the goddess Isis makes a present to the pharaoh. He gives them a jet pillar. What is he giving to him? What is that jet pillar? We continue that story. First, Abydos, when you ever go to as a tourist to Abydos, don't go only inside the temple and watch these wonderful paintings. Go outside in the back of the temple. Then you come to a place which is called the Osirion. Why is the Osirion? You know, the oldest uh, god in Egypt was Osiris. Osiris is equal as Orion, the star. It's the same thing, Osiris and Orion. And uh, there is a legend, Os Osiris had a brother, and his brother didn't like uh, Osiris, and he killed his brother. And he uh, separated his body into different pieces, and the head of, the, of Osiris would be buried here. That's why they call it Osirion. Now this is down under the temple of Setos. 
Now look at these blocks here. Cut perfectly. Now these blocks, again, are granite from Aswan. Aswan is about 500 kilometers from here. Of course, this is on the Nile. So they could transport it from the Nile. And then they had to make a, a grounding with, with gigantic stones and to put these blocks perfectly over it. And look at the technology. And imagine what sort of crane they had. Transport these blocks from Aswan down there put them here, some crane must have put them precisely into the next opening, you see here. This is high technology. And this is much older than the temple of Setos, because the temple of Setos is built over that Osirion. That means this is older than the temple. Now, yesterday I told you something about the evolution of technology. The evolution of technology, our Stone Age people, they start very slowly. They find out uh, that you can put some stone, a little wall, before you are uh, cave. So the animals, the wild animals cannot come into the cave. Later you, you find out that you can cut the stones. Then you find out that there are different stones uh, in different degrees, hard and soft and so on. You can cut them, you can polish them, etc. It's all an evolution evolution of technology. It takes really hundreds and hundreds of years before your evolution of technology is so advanced that you construct these gigantic blocks up to 80 tons. Evolution of technology that you can transport them from Aswan here. That you have the technology to put them exactly on place. This is evolution. But you see the temple of Setos is built over these blocks. This Osirion is older than the temple, which means the evolution of technology is completely upside down. It should be the other ways. The primitive technology, the small stone block, should be down, and the higher technology should be up. Some archaeologists, among them a Swiss archaeologists, say this is the oldest uh, place, holy place in Egypt, even older than the pyramid. But now uh, the pyramid officially it's about 2500 BC. According to the literature, it's about 14,000 BC. It's still a mystery, Osirion. And we are still on the hint of this jet pillar. See a, uh, a little movie. Uh, you see, there is the water down here. The water comes from the Nile. The Nile is just about 200 meters away which means technology is more complicated. They had to provide the water. The water could not be there before they start building. Mysterious. And those of you who have been in uh, Peru, in Cusco, and in Sexayon, you remember the walls there? It's the same way of building. But here we are in Egypt. And this construction is not comparable to this up here. But this is Setos, and this is unknown. It's how much data I have. Again, on the Nile, there is another temple called Dendera. This is Dendera from outside. Now, Dendera is a relatively young temple. It comes from the time of Ptolemies, it means about 200, 300 uh, BC, so not very old. But this temple is constructed on a level on the ground which is thousands of years old. In reality, on this level, four different temples existed. Now look at the ceiling of it. Here you see the gods again, Osiris, in his ship, in his bark, between the stars. It's not the sun who rises up in the east and goes over the Nile and sinks in the west. The gods are on the stars, between the stars, in their ships. And I told you the ground is very, very old. No one knows how old it is. But if you ever are in Dendera, go to this place. There's a little opening, not bigger than for a dock. You have to climb in this opening, which I see it here. Into the ground, 
the, the movement of the ground. And you enter a living room, very small, but the walls, left and, and right, are filled with hieroglyphs. You see how small the room is. The man is just set space by one man. And then again, we find this miracle of the jet pillar. And here it looks techno technical. Because this looks like an electric uh, bulb. And the jet pillar, you see it here, is holding the bulb. And it looks as if some electricity comes in here. And uh, two apes are symbolizing the danger of it. In official archaeology, this is just the womb of an unknown godness who gave birth to Osiris. But it could also have a technical interpretation. Maybe it's something completely different. Some uh, 40 years ago, in Egypt and also in Persia, different objects were found. And when these objects were opened, inside there were two different sorts of metal, iron and copper. And this is a cylinder of copper, and there is a piece of, of iron in there. And down you found a little piece of, uh, a bit of acid, like acid from lemon or acid from wine. If you have two different metals, and with acid and put it together, this means an electrical battery. And in fact, it gives electrical power. We have uh, made a copy of it in Interlaken in Switzerland, the mystery park. A copy of it, we put acid of lemon inside, different uh, metals, and of course, it gives light. So the question is, did our forefathers in Egypt, did they have electricity? Now I don't think of our electricity daily, not at all. I just think some priest knew something from the gods. Maybe they were able to enlighten just a little room to make like a miracle for, for the people. The people adored them and they on command, hey look at this, something is lighting and shining. It's the gods coming to us. And this secret is symbolized down in the temple of Dendera. And the jet pillar will be part of this system of electricity. That's just an idea. But the final answer is, nobody knows. For me, God is timeless. God doesn't make an experiment, and then he has to wait what the result is. He knows the result in advance, because he's out of time. So he should knew in advance that Adam and Eve would eat their apple. But obviously he didn't knew. And now he's very, very suspected. And he chose the two people out of paradise. Well, okay. Out of paradise. Now, Adam and Eve, they are not in paradise anymore, but all their descendants, they are punished with the so-called original sin, according to our Christian religion. Now, in the Bible, it says God created everything, and God created Adam and Eve, and God said it was good. But later, God did not find it good anymore. And he decided to destroy all the <coughs> mankind through a great flood, the great flood, the biblical flood. So, I mean, all the humans now are dead except Noah and his ark. But the original sin should be washed away now because there are no humans anymore except uh, Noah. But now, the original sin still exists and much later, thousands of years later, the Almighty God uh, sends Jesus to us as the Son of God, according to Thai religion. And now Jesus is working around, he's preaching, he's doing good things, but these idiots of humans don't understand him. They don't understand what he says, and finally they even torture him, and they kill him, and they crucify him. And now God, the Almighty God, is happy, and this original sin is forgiven. Something sounds unlogical to me in here. <laughs> what, 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 what are we learning? So, I don't know. Anyhow, that's my religion, and in the Jewish community they believe the same thing in the beginning. But only a few hundred years later, exactly 610 years later, uh, by, by the way, a, a big religion is made out of this idea of a Christian religion. 
and it is the religion of Christianity goes all over the planet. There is not only the Catholics, I mean, there are the Protestants, there are the Baptists, they are called all kinds of Christian, different, different religions, but they all mean the same thing, so, religion. But about uh, 610 years later, in today's Saudi Arabia, there's a young man with the name of Mohammed. And he says that an angel, the name was Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, and he had a vision of the angel Gabriel in a cave. And this Gabriel told him that our Christian religion is wrong. The God made a mistake. And now Gabriel is telling Mohammed the new religion, which is the Holy Quran, according to their belief. And now a gigantic new religion goes over the planet. In the meantime, we have one, uh, more than one billion uh, uh, Muslims on the world. But to my primitive knowledge, God can make no mistake. So first we have the God of Christianity with his original sin. Now an angel came and said, I'm sorry, there's all a mistake. I made a mistake. Now this is the newest religion here, the Muslim religion. But this is impossible. God makes no mistake. Or is this all just human? Was there no angel? Nothing behind it. And that story continues throughout centuries and centuries always. Humans have some visions, have some ideas, and new religions were found. You remember one of the religions here in your country are the Mormons. Now, I, I'm, I'm not a Mormon and I'm, uh, I respect every religion, but I know their story. Again, there was Joseph Smith, this young man in Palmyra, and Joseph Smith again, he had a vision. An angel with the name of Moroni came to him, showed him, and told him, you must go to this hill behind your house and there you will find a secret cave, and in the cave you will find metallic plates. So, Joseph Smith went there, he found the metallic plates, of course, but he could not read it. It was an unknown writing. So the angel Moroni gave him two stones and told him, told him, when you put these stones on your brain, you can read and translate these metallic uh, engravings. So he did that, and the result was the Book of Mormon. And again, of course, the Mormons respect the religion. They think our own, not only, our own, our own point of view is the correct point of view. That's what every religion says. Our view, viewing of the thing, is the only true thing. The other views are. But again, the real God, the God of eternity, the God of the universe, would never make mistakes. What are we doing? And finally, we are fighting since centuries because of all these religions each one against the other. We have hundred religions on the planet in the meantime. By the way, the Book of Mormon is not only uh, a story of the last century. The Book of Mormon starts thousands of years in the past. That was written on this metallic plates, which uh, uh, Joseph Smith translated. And it starts with a story which is incredible. That once, the that once, long before, Mormon, in a, in a place near Jerusalem today, there was a man called Le uh, Lehi. And Lehi again, he saw somebody descending from the sky in a glittering ray, glittering uh, suits. And this somebody ordered Lehi, you should construct two ships. And Lehi said to the angel, I, I cannot build ships. I am a simple shepherd, I have nothing to do with ships. But the, the God said, I will show you plans how you construct the ships. And he gave them plans. And the, the man around the lady, the carpenters, helped him to build these ships. Now I have another problem. In that case, lady receives plans to make ships in our Christian place, to be great. We have the, the great flood, and God gives Noah again the plans to construct the ark. So long, so large, etc. We have the Kogi Indians, which you saw before in South America, with this telos. They again said, the gods give them plans to construct a ship. What kind of god is this? In each of all these things, which cannot make just like this, focus, focus, and here are the ships. He needs technology. He is not almighty. He needs technology, plans, wood, to construct the ship. So, in that case too, Lehi constructs two ships. When they enter the ships, they saw, they realized that it was completely dark inside the ship. There was no light. So the so-called God gave them 
uh, for each ship two bulls, shining bulls. There was light in there. And finally, they give the God, give to the, uh, the, the answers of the model, two compasses. For every ship, a compass. And tell them what the needle shows, there we have to go. So they crossed the sea, the answers of the Mormons, they crossed the sea. According to the Mormons, they arrived in today's Chile. They slowly went up to South America until the lake, uh, Salt Lake City, in your state where they live today. Now, all this is a story of religion, always inspired by some angels. Which angels are this? What is going on? Why do we all believe our angel, our religion, our point of view? is the only one. And this story continues until to our days. In Fatima, Fatima is a place in Portugal. On the October 13, 1917, something incredible happened. Uh, three children, two girls and a boy, were out and uh, they had their ships and all of a sudden they saw the vision of a wonderful lady in a white garment. And the lady had around their head stars, a crown of stars. And of course, Fatima is a Catholic place in today's Portugal. Whole Portugal is Catholic. So for the children, this apparition was definitely the mother of the mother Mary, the mother of Jesus. So these children went back to their home and told the story. We saw the mother over a, a tree. And the adults said, now come on, this is all a mistake, you have dream, you have fantasy, it's not true. But the oldest lady, the oldest girl, Lucia, stamped on the ground and said, no, mama, this is absolutely true because the lady promised us she will return every month, the following months, for six months, at the same uh, time, so it was at 10, 15 in the morning, every month at the same time, every year, by the way. So, uh, every year. And then said in October, yes, uh, 13 October, uh, no, it started on, on 13 of, Ma, uh, of uh, May, of May, 1970, that's important, so, 17, yes, 17. So, every month again, of course, always more adults went with the children out of the field. And exactly at the time, the three children fell down on their knees, they started to pray, they looked up to, to the tree, but nobody else saw something. Just the three children. Of course, they had a vision because they were speaking. You see, they were moving their lips and they were pale and they had big eyes. But nobody else saw something. This repeated every month, always at 10, 15 in the morning until October 17th, 1917. 17. And then at that day, 80,000 people came out of the field with the children. 80,000 people. On that day, it was raining. There are, in 1917, there were no, no color uh, talk, uh, pictures of today. You only have black and white pictures. So out of newspapers, I took some of these old pictures. You see 80,000 people on the field. It was raining. They all had their uh, umbrellas. And of a sudden, exactly on the minute where the Holy Mary should appear, the heavens opened. And they saw a gigantic disc. And the disc turned all the time. And while the disc was turning, different colors in different uh, shapes appeared. This spectacle took place for four minutes. You see, now it's not raining anymore. All these people are looking up there, blinded somehow by, by the light. It took four minutes. In the Catholic Church now, this is called the miracle of the sun. And Fatima has become a pilgrim place. Today, at least uh, every uh, year, more than two million pilgrims are going to Fatima. In the children, uh, in, in the church of Fatima, in the cathedral, this miracle of the sun is shown in the in, in the glass uh, picture up there. Now, one of the children, the oldest one, Lucia, she later becomes a sister in the convent. She received a telepathic message from this white lady. And the white lady ordered the child, you should put this message down in your school uh, 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 book, whatever. And give, it, give this message to the highest responsible of this planet. The highest responsible. With the order, 
he should open this message for whole mankind, humanity, in 1960, on October 17, 1960. That means 47 years later. So for the girl, for, for, the, for Lucia, the child, it was Mother Mary. And she believes, well, the highest, she means the Pope. So this message, the secret, went to the local priest, from the local priest to the bishop, from the bishop to the cardinal of Portugal, from the cardinal to the Vatican in Rome. In, in Rome. With the order, you should open this message for all humanity on October 17th, 1960. 1960 arrived. The journalists knew, of course, about this date because this uh, girl, Lucia, she went to a convent and sometimes she gave an interview. Journalists asked them, Mother Lucia, what is written in the secret of Fatima? And she always said, I have no permission to say anything about it, but the Pope will open it for all of us on October 17, 1960. So October 17, that's just the Pope's who since then ruled. The date arrived. The Pope in Rome assembled about 70 bishops and archbishops, etc. Outside the door were journalists, 20 journalists. They were waiting, what's the secret of Fatima? Finally the doors opened and all these bishops came out and they were pale and wet and perspiring and they had wet colors. And the journalists asked them, what is the message of Fatima? What did the Holy, Holy Virgin Mary give to the child? And they all said, no comment, no comment, no comment. <laughs> Only the Pope, when the Pope himself came out, he had to say something. The journalist asked, what is in the secret of Fatima? And the Pope said, I cannot publish the secret. It would create a panic. The Pope said, I cannot publish, it would create a panic. <laughs> now again, I am educated as a Catholic. And as a Catholic, it is, uh, we have to believe that the Mother Mary was the mother of Jesus Christ. And the Mother Mary went to heaven with her body. So in religious talk, Mother Mary is the highest female in heaven. So one would assume that Mother Mary knows exactly what she does. And she gives the order to the children. Give this message to the Pope, to the highest. And he should publish it in October 17, 1960. And the Pope reads it and says, I, I cannot do this. It would create a panic. Oh my God. But the order comes from his highest female boss up there. Why is she not publishing this? <laughs> now in that time, in 1960, there was still Cold War between the Soviet Union and the, the West. There was still Cold War. And we always were afraid at that time that somebody would knock down the other nation, that they would send Pershing uh, SS-20 rockets and so on. So the journalists, which did not receive an answer from the Pope, went to the Bishop of Leira. Portugal has different uh, uh, is that the canton, uh, uh, provinces. And Fatima is part of the province of Leira. So the journalists went to the uh, bishop of Leira and asked him, what is in that secret of Fatima? Has it to do with the next world war? With the Russians and Americans start some rockets? Are we destroying all it? And the bishop of Leira said, no, it has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with the next world war. It has to do with our faith, with our belief. Now, I really are full of problems concerning this story. The Pope did not publish. The Pope said it would create a panic. The Bishop of Leila said, now, it has nothing to do with the next world war. It has to do with our faith, with our belief. But Mother Mary knows exactly what she's doing. So what was in the message? Now, what I can offer is only a speculation. I think that in 1917, some extraterrestrials were here. They observed our planet again, and they realized that in 1917, we had no global communication systems. In 1917, there were no satellites. There were no television, global television. If a king in 1917 would stand before the microphone, the world would not hear him. 
they realize this, these extraterrestrials. They get in contact with children and give to the oldest children a telepathic message. Why to children? Why do they go, they don't go to a scientist or to a politician? The brains of children are still free, innocent. You know, the brains of adults, we have problems. Be it financial problems, <laughs> be it problems with love, be it problems with whatever it is, we all have problems. We are not innocent. So you contact an innocent person. If they would have contact, for example, a scientist or a politician, and this politician would come and say, hello, I had a vision of extraterrestrial, a message. The, the human humanity would say, is he crazy or what? Is he wrong? So no chance. They have to do it by the children. They give a message. They give a message and the Pope in 1960 reads the message. And he realizes it was not Mother Mary in Fatima. It was extraterrestrials. But in the meantime, from 1917 to 1960, Fatima has become a gigantic pilgrim place in honor of the Holy Mary. Now really the Pope cannot say to mankind, I'm sorry, it was a mistake. It was not the Holy Mary. It was extraterrestrial. He cannot tell the truth. That's why he said, I cannot publish it. I can, a panic would break out. And later the Bishop of Leila says, well, it has nothing to do with the world war. It has to do with us. Now we have a real problem. A contact of extraterrestrials. Why, if extraterrestrials exist, why do they don't go directly to somebody? For example, to the Pope. Would be a great idea. So, <laughs> the problem is uh, our society. Our society always wants to be reasonable. We want to be logic. We don't want to be idiots. We don't want to be ridiculed. Now, for example, the scientific community says to us, UFOs do not exist. If somebody says, yes, I saw a UFO, somehow it's a crank. So they don't take it for serious. The scientific community says, well, the distance of people in the stars are too big. We cannot reach them. But now they are here. So we are not serious anymore. Everybody wants to be serious. We have newspapers, thousands of newspapers on this globe. We have ten thousands of TV stations. Be the newspaper or be the TV station, it's always behind, it's always an ownership. Somebody owns the journal or the, the, the television. This is a matter of political party, is the private person, somebody owns it. Now, <coughs> imagine in a serious newspaper like New York Times, you would have a front page that somebody saw a UFO and he was talking with extraterrestrials. Now, the public does not take this newspaper anymore for serious. The owner of the newspaper will tell to his uh, uh, editor-in-chief, are you crazy? What are you doing? We lose our readers. We are not serious anymore. It's a problem of our society. The society has to be prepared for such an event. Even, to accident to come to this point, if the Pope, and the Pope is a very respected person in our society, if the Pope will go to his balcony, and down there are 50,000 Christians, and the Pope would say in all seriosity, yesterday night I had a long discussion with two extraterrestrials. <laughs> now his own believers and the journalists would say, What's, what, is he insane, the Pope? What's wrong with him? So even if you are a high politician, if your President Obama would make such an announcement, or the Pope, he would not be taken for serious. The society is not prepared for it. This takes a long time to change the society. Before you can shock the society with such news, news which are the truth. I know for sure that extraterrestrials were here some thousands of years ago. I cannot prove it directly. I don't have an, an extraterrestrial object in my treasure, but I have thousands of indications which made the place key, clear even before any court. I told you, I'm just not right here. So, not right here, okay. Okay, it's great, I'm not So, and these extraterrestrials in the past promised our ancestors to return to Earth. Yesterday I was talking about Enoch, the prophet Enoch, which was up there in the sky in a mother spaceship with extraterrestrials. 
finally he went down again to say goodbye to his fellows, to his son Methuselah. Methuselah asked his father, Papa, will I see you again? Will you come back here again? And Methuselah, Enoch said to his son Methuselah, I will return to earth. They promised me the guardians of the trade sky. They will bring me back to earth. But then, until then, thousands of years have passed, we will not see each other again. So this promise of return existed long time before Christianity. And as I said yesterday, every religion has this expecting of return. And I think they are here already. They are observing us. But you cannot go to the big public with this. I show you now a UFO film, a film of a UFO, which was taken over Puerto Rico on April 26, 2013. I received this film from a fighter pilot, a US fighter pilot. They were looking for uh, drugs, you know, uh, illegal drugs there. And of a sudden, he had a UFO in his uh, camera. I don't have to explain this. You see it, it's from the front camera. Here the UFO is coming. On the back here, uh, down, and on every, you find all the, the exact data, like what day it is, geographical position, what is the speed, etc. You see the object here? Sometimes you have the feeling that the object wanted to be filmed because it went slower. It crossed <laughs> a few hills, a few acres the airport, the airport of Aguadilla. The airport was closed for two hours. And next to the airport is just a, a harbor. It went over, over a few ships on the Pacific side and jumped into the water. You see the water fountains coming up, not just an illusion because of all these interruptions. That the sage changed all the time. It comes into the water, but when it's out of the water, all of a sudden there are two of them, separated into two. You will see it. I come here. Two. Yeah. So this is a UFO film which nobody can falsify, falsificate because of the inscription with all the data around. It's original. So they are here. Somebody is watching us again. What way they are not showing up? Yesterday you understood that we are the offsprings of them. So all this evolution stuff, life started because of DNA from outside. We are the offsprings of them. So they know exactly how we react. They know how our brain functions. They know how our religion functions on this planet, our politic functions. If they would show up just like this, show up over a football stadium, there are 80,000 people already, and all the cameras are already there, humanity would be shocked, completely shocked. Religions would lose. For our Western religions, we could help ourselves because we never lose God. The Almighty God always stands at the end of the chain. Whatever it is, God, you cannot destroy. God exists. But we would lose a lot of our faith in our religion, especially the Muslim world. If you would tell something like this in a Muslim world, and tell all the story that the Muhammad had, that he said an archangel visited me. I'm sorry, it's not true. You were talking to somebody else, but not to an archangel of God. That would be a catastrophe for religion. And the extraterrestrials know it. They know our reaction. That's why they are not shocking us. They are th making it slowly. There is a hypothesis which explains all this. It's called the Zoo Hypothesis. The Zoo Hypothesis say, imagine that our whole planet, with everything on it, which grows and flows, we all are part of a zoological garden. We are always under observation. A geological garden. Now the geological garden has, of course, visitors. Was it Wächter? Watchers. A geological garden has visitors and has watchers. And both have to keep certain rules. The watchers have to look that nothing is harmed, that nothing is destroyed, etc. The visitors have to keep the rule. For example, visitors are not allowed to give a, a, a living dog to a crocodile. Or, or to, to take some uh, fetal feathers out of an extreme uh, uh, papagai, for example. So, we all have certain rules. Now, the watchers, 
realize that in this geological garden earth there is one group which grows up quicker which develops culture mathematic science songs music we develop all kind of things they observe this and they even observe that we start to make little space travel we make a shot to the moon we send some satellites to the mars and now the watchers ask themselves should we allow these humans to leave their planet or not according to the rule of zoo hypothesis they must allow it but only when we understood freely that we are not alone on this planet that there are many other civilizations out there why uh, there are suggestions that maybe in 20 years uh, a group of humans will fly to mars okay it will be a primitive capsule but the capsule has windows now our group is flying on Mars long, long time, and then they have their camera and they see a gigantic spaceship. And they film this spaceship through the, the window and then send, send it to the Earth. And all mankind can see, hey, there's a gigantic spaceship, because whatever, a, a big ship. Now again, we are shocked. So first, mankind has to learn and to understand that we are not alone. There are other intelligent beings out there. And only if we understood this, the majority of us, then we are free to leave our solar system and to get in contact with them. That's the two hypothesis. And the two hypothesis somewhere makes sense to me. I know for sure we are under observation. And we can prove it. I had the chance in my life to talk to so many honest people also scientific trained people, including astronomers, who told me their stories about UFOs. And I always ask them, you are a professor, you are a doctor professor, why don't you go to public? And they all say, Eric, I will be completely ridiculed. I will never go to public with it. I tell it to you personally. I was not even able, allowed to, to, to publish it in my book. But I have these conversations with so many people in the world. I know the situation will change. I give it at least the next 10, 15 years. And then officially, we will realize that we are not alone on this uh, universe. That there are a lot of other beings out there. And that they were here some thousands of years ago. They are here again. At the moment, they are learning our language. They are learning our science. Are we a danger? Do we have developed weapons which could be dangerous for them? How about our virus, our bacteria? Somebody cannot just shake hands and then you are infected. You have to find out everything. What about our political, religious system? How do we function, etc.? So that's a program, a scientific program, which is going on at the moment. I'm always asked, are these extraterrestrials bad? Will they kill us? If they would kill us, if they wish to get, they could do it at any time. In the past and in the present, never. In the past, they were always helpful. They were always teachers. And those ones who can, they will teach us again. We have, for example, we have questions like, we have a lot of pollution over there. Now, the extraterrestrials will not s s solve the problem of our pollution, but we can ask them, in your evolution, you had the same problems. How do you solve it in your time? They will tell us how they solve the problem. And then we have to do it. We have to do the job. Nobody does the job for it. We know Albert Einstein told us the speed of light is the absolute maximum speed which can exist. But they have over speed of light. How does it function? So, if we want to have a radio contact with our radio system, you have an antenna on Earth, and not, let's say you go, uh, you seek a contact with Sirius. Sirius is about 12 light years away. So we ask them, how do you do? How are you? Please send us a message back. So our message will get, take 12 years until it's on Sirius. Then they give an answer, we are well, okay, send you greeting. It takes another 12 years. That means a communication with extraterrestrials is incredible. 12 years go and 12 years back. And there are other solar systems who are 20 or 100 light years away from us. So we have to ask the extraterrestrial, how did you solve this problem? That we can communicate in the intercosmic radio with everyone. At the moment, we are not able to do it. So all these things will change. Technology will change we will realize that we are a greater family than we believe. And on Earth, we always have wars, of course. Wars because of religion, wars because of nationality, whatever. Soon, 
as we understood then, the whole uh, mankind, that there is life out there, and we are in contact with life out there. All the wars on Earth make no sense anymore. There is no more reason to fight against whatever, the blacks, or the white, or the Christians, or the Muslims, it makes no sense anymore. We realize all the humans are part of this little blue bull in the universe. And we are the united mankind. And we as united mankind, we correspond, we speak to another race or whatever it is out there. So <coughs> it will be peace on earth. And all this will be good for us. In the past, we had, my God, enough wars. So, ladies and gentlemen, I stop with this here, because it's going into politics, into religion. <laughs> I, never, I never lost my God. Yesterday, I was praying about 15 minutes, lying in my bed, talking to the universe. I feel it's wonderful. And sometimes people make a compliment to me and say, Eric, they are 80, come on, you don't look like 80. And your brain functions, and I always have the impression, that's because I'm praying. That's because I'm talking to the universe, to gigantic God. Also not knowing what God is, I always say thank you for this great universe. It's, it's, it's wonderful to be a part, a little teeny part of this great universe. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what keeps me young, and what keeps my brain working. I have a certain message worldwide. I go around and tell these stories about spaceships in the past, switching in the past, and more and more people in TV stations listen to me. The uh, yesterday, the lady who announced me, they said, okay, Eric has sold uh, 65 million copies of books which is true, everybody has to be, well, he must be very rich, my God, 65 million dollars. Every book he has one or one dollar at least. That's all, forget it. I, I'm not a rich man, though. Every year I have problems to pay my taxes. So, <laughs> so but how can, I mean, Chariots of the Gods came on the market in 1968. That's long time ago, 45 years ago. So, of course, I have wonderful ears where I earned let's say three, four hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars. But during the time of 45 years, money comes in and money goes out. <laughs> I have a big office, an office which works fantastically. We have roughly about 180,000 pictures in our archive. So that means all work, work, work. You have to, to be fair and correct. Here, my friend Ramon, my <laughs> secretary. And so, so money goes in and money goes out. I have never become a rich man, but I have become a little bit more intelligent than I was before. Of course, I made my mistakes in my life. Everyone makes mistakes, but we learn out of the mistakes. And I hope to have the chance to continue worldwide with my message, with my message for the next five or seven years. Thank you for listening. Going to be a guest on our cruise uh, next year in 2016. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay.